Good morning. Um, we are moving once again on to a new topic. We're going to start looking at rotational motion. So uh, up until now, most of the motion that we've looked at has been, I guess, what we call linear. Uh, we did look at circular motion, uh, but now we're going to look at, at kind of full-blown rotational motion. Um, and that's involved with objects which, where the object as a whole has some uh, axis around which that object is rotating. So in this case, we've got the Ferris wheel, we've got the, in the foreground, we've got the uh, merry-go-round. And uh, for each of these, for the Ferris wheel, we've got an axis right through the center. And then we have this entire structure that can be treated as one rigid structure. So the entire Ferris wheel is rotating around that axis. So what we want to be able to do is go in and go, okay, for different locations, on the Ferris wheel, some are close to the axis, some are far away. Which ones are moving faster? Which ones are moving slower? Are they all moving the same speed? In, in some sense, they're all moving the same rotational speed because the object is rigid, and that means when this part makes one full rotation, uh, every other part of the Ferris wheel has made also one full rotation. So we're going to have to make a distinction between what's rotational um, velocity, what's rotational displacement, what's rotational acceleration, versus what's linear uh, velocity, linear displacement, linear acceleration. So, um, so let's take a look. We got all, you know, we're on a planet that is rotating. So uh, we've got, you know, all kinds of rotation to, um, to take a look at. So um, here are the list of topics. I'm going to move through these. You can come back and use those as a reference uh, or as help organize your notes. Uh, but we're going to start off with these rotational quantities. Now, it's called rotational motion or angular motion. Um, and, and some of these quantities are are referred to as rotational. Sometimes we call them rotational. Sometimes we call them angular. So for better or worse, we have two words for these. Uh, and, and I'll probably switch back and forth to some. Uh, they're calling these angular quantities. We could have called it rotational quantities. It's saying in purely rotational motion, all the points on the object move in circles. That means that we can use everything we talked about with uh, circular motion and that's going to apply for individual locations. So here is this object. Now, it's always interesting. When things are rotating, we draw them often, more often than not, as being round. But you don't have to be round to be rotating. And then when we draw objects that are rotating, often we pick uh, the center of the object, or the center of the circle in this case, uh, and we say that's the origin, and that's the point around which everything is rotating. And you don't have to be rotating around the center, either. So you could be rotating around a different location. We could have an axis of rotation here. It wouldn't be as symmetric or as balanced. We could have an uh, axis of rotation here, where the object is kind of wobbling back and forth around a contact point. So um, anyway, let, make, make, we're, we're going to try and emphasize that as we go along. We're going to try and, and pick out different axes of rotation. But just to get started, we are going to have a round object, it looks like. We've got a, an origin or an axis of rotation that's right at the center of that circle. They've picked a point, uh, point P, and they're saying, look, if this object rotates as a rigid object, then point P is going to map out a circle. By the time it's gone all the way around, it will have completed one uh, complete cycle of circular motion, one complete cycle of rotational motion also. Um, so the axis is going to be important. We're going to always want to point out where the axis is. Um, now, the radius of the circle, that just depends on uh, how far point P is away from, from the axis of rotation. Um, all the points on a straight line drawn through the axis move through the same angle 
in the same amount of time. So they're just taking a bunch of points along here. They're lining them all up. In fact, they're drawing a line between uh, the axis and, and the point out here. And what they're showing is as this begins to rotate through an angle theta, that line all rotates together. So uh, we've got a picture here where it's gone through an angle L. And uh, angles uh, are, are defined mathematically. An angle is defined as the arc distance, L, divided by R. Now this is something that you've seen, or, or definitely should have seen, in, in your math classes. So in your math classes, they should have spent a good amount of time. Uh, physics really makes use of these angular quantities. So if you've learned them, that's great. You're going, to have, you're going to see a lot of examples to use those angular quantities. If, you have, if you're a little fuzzy on them, which is often the case, uh, we're, going to look at, we're going to have a lot of uh, examples to work from in physics. So as is often the case, it's, you know, it's kind of in physics where you see, oh, that's what the math means. You know, that's what it uh, applies to. So that's, that's kind of where we're headed. So again, if L is the arc length and uh, R is the radius, then theta is the angle in radians. Now, what would happen if it made one complete uh, circle so that theta was equal to 2 pi radians? Then the circumference would be 2 pi r. Uh, L would be equal to 2 pi r, and the r's would cancel out, and that's where the 2 pi definition comes from. So a complete cycle would mean a circumference. L would be equal to 2 pi r, the r's cancel out. So mathematically, radians are the, the natural units to work from. Those are standard units of rotation. Now, we have other units, though, for rotation. So um, let's, let's talk about that a bit, too, as, as we get in. Uh, what's another way we could describe that angle? You know, what kind of units could we be using? We could be using degrees, right? We could say that one complete cycle is 360 degrees. Uh, so 360 degrees is the same angular uh, distance, angular displacement, as 2 pi radians would be. And then finally, we could also say that uh, 2 pi radians is equal to one cycle. 360 degrees is equal to one cycle. We could just count cycles, or rotations, or revolutions. So uh, if we just count how many times this thing rotates, or revolves, uh, those are good units too. So the formulas often, uh, more often than not, are going to require us to work in, in terms of radians, uh, but we'll see that there's, there's times when we can, uh, there's some flexibility with the units that we're working in. Be prepared to use radians. All right, so uh, just to think, uh, to get used to what this, these angles mean, so here is an eagle, I think, right? Maybe it's the Laney eagle. So, uh, ooh, the Laney eagle actually is right here. So, there's Laney the eagle, the uh, course mascot. All right, so there's the eagle. Oh, we could do this too, right? So, uh, there we go. Three-dimensional kind of stuff going on there with, uh, with our eagle. Uh, so, the eagle is looking down at an object, hmm, okay, looking at an object, that's what the mouse is being listed as here, just an object, and then there's an angle here. What we could do is we could say, what, what angle uh, does that mouse, that object, subtend? Um, and so what we can do is we can measure the distance from you know, one end to the other, and then we can measure what the distance is out to where the angular measurement is being made. So that's like an axis um, of, of angular measurement. Uh, so let's see how this, it says that um, this bird's eye can see objects uh, down to about three times 10 to the minus fourth radians. Okay, so let's see how that's working. Uh, the bird is flying at a height of 100 meters, so we can put that in for the distance. And then um, the angle that the bird is able to resolve. So as objects get smaller and smaller, their angular size um, is going to decrease also.
uh, along with uh, distance has an effect on that too. Uh, and so what we can do then is, uh, so I call this distance at S, I guess I didn't call it L. Uh, and then theta can be solved. Uh, first of all, they wanted us to put this in degrees. So I used the conversion factor here. I said that 180 degrees is the same thing as pi radians. So that's a, a handy conversion factor. And it says that this bird, this eagle, can uh, pick out objects that are angularly as small as uh, a couple hundredths of a degree. Okay, so think of what an angle of one, th one degree would look like. Uh, and then this is saying that, uh, you know, the eagle can see right down to a couple hundredths of a degree. And if we put that angle in with the distance r, then we can find out what size object this bird is able to resolve. And it turns out that uh, this bird can resolve things all the way down to three centimeters from a distance of a hundred meters. So that's pretty good, right? You think of three, uh, 100 meters, that would be all the way across a soccer field or all the way across a football field. And there's an object there that's three centimeters and uh, the, the bird is able to uh, pick that out from what's going on in the background. Now I think there was another, how small, oh, yep, that was it. Okay, so uh, I guess this is a, a situation where the animal wants to make themselves as small as possible, right? or blend in with the background. Um, okay, and then again, here are the conversions. So one rotation is the same thing as two pi radians, and one rotation is the same thing as 360 degrees. So those are conversions that we definitely are gonna be using all through the, um, all through the, the uh, chapter here. Um, all right, so we've got a, a bicycle wheel, which is a good example. Now, we're actually going to use this as an axle. We're going to hold up that bicycle wheel, and we're going to let the bicycle wheel uh, rotate, I guess, this way. So we got the, the wheel rotating. Now, in your math classes, they probably called this a positive angle, and, and that's kind of the convention we have in physics and, and engineering, too. So we'll say, okay, fine, this is a positive direction, this is a negative direction. We could reverse that. We saw that with linear motion, we got to decide on the coordinate system. And in rotational motion, it's the same idea. We get to decide on the um, coordinate system. And uh, what we do is try and pick a coordinate system that makes solving the problem uh, as, as uh, easy or as um, uh, straightforward, maybe, as possible. So what they're doing is they're talking about angular displacement. An angular displacement at delta theta, it's a lot of Greek, is equal to theta 2 minus theta 1. So what they're saying here is, okay, uh, theta 1 took us to here, and then the wheel kept rotating, and so there was an additional delta theta, and that took us to here, and we're going to call that entire distance theta 2. So, so delta theta is theta 2 minus theta 1. Um, now, back in linear motion, this was like delta x is equal to x2 minus x1. Now, for some reason, I, I feel like x is easy. You guys are so used to working with x in all your math classes. And theta, you're just not as familiar with. Uh, sometimes just using the different notation makes a difference. But uh, we can define an average angular velocity by taking delta theta and dividing it by delta t. Now, when you think about that, that's the same definition we used when we were looking at linear velocities. We did delta x divided by delta t. Well, instead of a linear distance, we have an angular or a rotational distance, and that delta theta is being divided through by delta t. Now, there's a instantaneous angular velocity. So what we can do is we can take shorter and shorter time periods, and then as we go to shorter and shorter time periods, in the limit where delta t becomes really small, we can carry that over and um, refer to that as a, a, a derivative, as a little bit of an angle divided by a little bit of time. So dt is our time interval, and d theta is a really tiny, tiny angular 
displacement or rotational displacement. Uh, standard units, uh, the angle itself would be in radians, uh, omega would be in radians per second. Uh, omega is equal to delta t over delta, um, delta theta over delta t. And so that omega is uh, the angular velocity. Now, um, it's omega, it's not w. Uh, so remember that. This is uh, it's a Greek letter. Uh, this is omega. And, and we've got our definition now of angular velocity. Um, we can do the same thing with angular acceleration. So what we're doing is, go back and look at the uh, linear uh, kinematics chapters. We're doing rotational kinematics right now. And what we're doing is, uh, everywhere, everywhere there used to be uh, an x, it's now theta. And everywhere there used to be a v, it's now omega, which is the angular velocity. And just to follow that up, we're going to define an angular or a rotational acceleration. So uh, an angular acceleration on average would come from measuring how much the um, rotational velocity has varied over a certain time period. So during the time for interval, delta t, uh, delta omega will have some value. Now, uh, we're going to call this, um, this is alpha. Uh, so see, we have alpha and we have omega. We have the beginning of the Greek alphabet. We have the end of the Greek alphabet uh, in here. Uh, this is for angular accelerations, and that's going to be the limit as the time intervals get smaller and smaller of how d omega is varying with respect to time. How much is the velocity changing during a, a small time interval. Now the units here then would need to be uh, radians per second squared, or radians per second per second. So those are our angular acceleration or rotational um, acceleration units. All right. So what, what happens is this. Um, when you're doing these problems, uh, getting used to the notation, I, again, I think that's an important part of this. Um, if you can think of the problem as being a linear problem, and then you can convert back into rotational problems, I, I find that that's helpful sometimes. Uh, let's take a look and see um, one more time how some of these uh, quantities are related. Uh, if we've got a point P uh, on that rotating object, of that rotating platform or disk, whatever it is, if we allow that to rotate through a, a tiny angle, d theta, then the distance that we travel is going to be dl, or ds, as I think you guys know now is, is my uh, preferred notation for that. So we've got each point on here is in circular motion. How fast is it traveling? And v is going to be equal to r times omega. So the distance that um, something is traveling uh, linearly uh, is equal to r times omega. And this velocity is going to be in meters per second. So we've, we've made uh, contact between the uh, rotational quantities, the uh, omega, right, and the v. Now what's happening here is, let's see, let's line up a bunch of points. Point A, point B, point C, point D. Uh, if this thing is rotating, how do the different values of omega vary for different locations on the disk. And everybody has the same omega because the disk is rigid and the entire disk is rotating in an angular fashion altogether. So uh, it, it doesn't matter where you're located, A, B, C, or D, everybody's got the same omega. Well, does that mean everybody has the same linear velocity? And you go, no, it depends on how far you are from the axis of rotation. So uh, everybody's got the same omega if this object is rigid and it's rotating. But for each of the different objects to find out how fast they're moving in terms of meters per second, you've got to multiply by the distance from the axis. All right, so that's connecting uh, between, well, Circular motion, right? When we were looking at circular motion, 
we really worked in terms of a linear velocity and said that an object is moving at some speed v or some velocity v along that path. And now we're relating it to the rotational velocity of the entire object. All right, so uh, here's, a, here's an example. Uh, there's a conceptual example that says, is the lion faster than the horse? And it, it turns out, you gotta jump ahead a bit to see what this is from. There it is, here's the picture. Uh, so the picture is right here. Oh, they're on a merry-go-round. So what they're asking here is, okay, if you get on a merry-go-round, um, do you want to sit closer to the axis or farther away? You go, well, it depends on how fast you want to travel, right? Uh, if you sit farther away, you're going to have to travel um, a higher distance. Uh oh, let's see, it was the, the lion and the horse. Where is, I see the horse. This looks like a pig. Uh, and there's a giraffe. Where is the lion? Oh, the lion's over here. So there is a lion over here. Now, I think the lion's going faster. Why? Because the lion's farther away from the axis of rotation. We've got to go back and pick up that. Uh, here we go. So, uh, <clears throat> the, oh, I got him backwards. Here's the merry-go-round. When I looked at the picture, for some reason, I thought the lion was, the pig was the lion, but the, the pig's not the lion. The, the pig's the pig. And so, uh, okay, uh, we'll, we'll switch it later on, but I'm going to say the lion is here, and the horse is here, and the horse is going faster. Now, what they told us uh, is that the rotational period for the merry-go-round is 10 seconds. What's a period? And that's the amount of time it takes to rotate once. So, um, it takes 10 seconds, and I'm thinking, well, that's probably good, you know, it's a pretty good size merry-go-round, we don't want to fly around too fast. Even at 10 seconds, it looks like we might be going pretty fast, but well, let's see. So, uh, I did this. I solved for omega. Let's put some numbers in. Now, the given information was one rotation every 10 seconds. And remember, rotation, that's a, that's a good unit uh, to work work from when we're looking at these rotations, uh, rotational motion. So one rotation every 10 seconds. Now, the conversion factors I'm going to need are there's two pi radians for every rotation. So the rotations will cancel out. I'm going to divide through by 10. And what I ended up with was an omega, or uh, an angular velocity, 0.628 radians per second. So that's my omega value. Now, if you're like me, I mean, the, the 10 second period, that makes sense, and the one rotation every 10 seconds makes sense, but if someone tells me the, the merry-go-rounds go on 0.628 uh, radians per second, I have to stop and think what that means and probably convert back into some different units. So, uh, we're, we're kind of stranded here between, uh, intuitively, we think in terms of rotations, but mathematically, more often than not, we have to work in terms of uh, radians um, as the unit for, uh, as the standard an angular unit. So uh, I just made up some numbers. Uh, I said that, I think, let me see, did they give us the numbers? Nah, I made some numbers up. So uh, I think I borrowed them from farther into the, um, into the, the notes here. Uh, I said that one of the radius is, is 4 meters, the other radius is 6 meters, and that meant I could find out in meters per second. I could go back and get a linear velocity, so that linear velocity is equal to the distance from the axis. The axis is right there. I need to write axis in on every diagram. Uh, and that's Ra times omega. Now what's going to happen here is I'm going to get units of meters per second, but look, I have units of radians left over. What do I do with it? And radians is the unitless unit. Uh, if you think back how the radians were defined, let's go back and take a quick look here. Uh, when we defined uh, radians, notice that, all the way back, huh? Uh, back when we first introduced radians, we said it was a distance divided by another distance. So it's an arc length, that's a distance, divided by uh, a distance from the center, which is another distance. So this would be 
standard units of meters divided by meters, the units go away. It turns out that radians are actually unitless. They're just placeholders. So the reason that we write down radians is to remind ourselves that we're not working in something other than radians. Uh, so we do write down radians, but what happens now is that uh, when we no longer need the radians, the radians can just be dropped because, again, there are no units associated with radians. Radians are unitless. So that's what I've done. What I did, uh, this is an angular quantity, omega, and it had radians in it, but when I convert it over to a linear quantity, I no longer need the, I, no, I don't want the radians in there, um, and we can just drop them. So the answers are coming out in meters per second, and uh, for the numbers that I came up with, uh, the, the point A is moving at 2.5 meters per second. That's like, I don't know, what is that? Five, six, seven miles an hour. And the uh, point B is moving at 3.77 uh, meters, meters per second. So those are the speeds um, at those two locations on the rotating platform. Now, uh, uh, again, objects farther from the axis of rotation, they're going to be moving faster. Okay. So you can see point A is heading out into a circular motion at this distance from the axis, and uh, point B is heading out at, uh, at a farther distance. So you're going to have to go fast, you're going to end up going faster with point B. Okay, uh, more rotational kinematics. Let's look at this. Now, uh, I want to say, I hope this is true. Angular displacement wasn't too difficult because you guys know your angles and you are familiar with units of radians. Uh, angular velocity was not too difficult because um, it, it, it just, it's like regular velocity, it's, it's like linear velocity, right? Where you're going around in a circle and as you go faster that goes up and when you go slower that slows down and the direction uh, we're going to have to talk about some more. So here's, here's something rotating with an angular velocity. What about accelerations? And here's where we hit uh, our first kind of complication. Now, it's, it's not something that's not doable. We just have to keep track of this. If, if we've got a point on a rotating object, and I like these bicycle wheels that they keep uh, presenting us with. Uh, let's say we select a point here. You know, if this is rotating at a constant, omega, there's already an acceleration because it's in circular motion. So there is what we call a radial acceleration, and the radial acceleration is given by v squared over r. Now we saw that back in chapter 5, and we've been using it ever since. We used it for circular orbits, um, we use it, use it a lot in chapter 5, uh, so we, we've seen this kind of stuff going on. Um, so that we've already been introduced to, and we've, we've derived why that, uh, what that formula will look like. But notice there's another kind of acceleration uh, that point P could have. It could be that omega is increasing. If omega goes faster and faster, then we will also have a linear acceleration, and we call that tangential. Now, I think we introduced that, too, back in Chapter 5 kind of at the end of circular motion, we just threw that in at the end and said, by the way, something going in circles could start going faster. They don't have to go at a constant velocity. Uh, so the way that a tan works is that's dvdt. Now, this is not vector dvdt. This is specifically how is the magnitude of the velocity increasing. And that can be written as uh, r times d omega uh, dt, uh, that can be written as r times uh, alpha. So we can take the v, replace it with r omega, and factor the r out if, it's, if r is constant, right? If it's one point on that rigid object, then r is remaining constant. And what we're going to end up with is r times alpha. So r times alpha doesn't give us the total acceleration, it only provides us with the angular acceleration. So there's going to be two components uh, of acceleration for these rotating objects. If it's rotating, there's always a radial acceleration. 
given by v squared over r. If it's also picking up speed, if it's rotating faster and faster or it's slowing down, there will be tangential accelerations at every location. Now, down here, this is our formula from circular motion, and uh, what they've done is they've taken the v and replaced it with r omega. The same thing they did up here, v got replaced with r omega, uh, but this time they have to square it and divide through by r. When they do that, they get an alternate version. So we can also calculate um, the radial acceleration. We can calculate as uh, omega squared times r. Uh, compare that with v squared over r. They're the same thing. So either approach will work depending on what we have to work from. We could work from either formula. Now just a reminder, these are classified as linear accelerations and uh, they're going to have units of meters per second squared. Meters per second squared, both of those components. All right, so um, I hope you're starting to see some of the similarities with what we've done in kinematics before. Again, it, it takes some practice. So uh, it definitely takes some practice um, comparing all these things. So, so here's a nice table that we can take a look at. Back in linear motion, we had x, v, and we had a tangential acceleration. Now that's if I'm winding my way along a path, uh, there is a, a distance that I travel, there's a velocity, and then there is a, an acceleration along that path. Kind of the rotational analogs are going to be theta, omega, and alpha. Now notice we haven't brought in radial acceleration uh, so far. Now the way they're related is when we have, uh, when we have something uh, rotating and we pick a point, maybe go back and take a look, there's a good, a good spot right there. So if we have something rotating and we pick a point and we ask how far does that point travel, how fast is it going, What's the acceleration right along the path that that point is following? That's what the table is, is uh, keeping track of. So the distance along that curved path is going to be given by x equals r theta. Now, I, since it's, so it's a little concerning to call this x, we probably should call it something else, s maybe. Uh, because the displacement is not purely in one direction, it's actually a circular path. But uh, just to drive home the analogy here, x is equal to r theta, v is equal to r omega, a tangential is equal to r alpha. So that's the comparison. Now, when we introduced uh, kinematics, linear kinematics, and we did displacements, and we did velocities, and we did accelerations, uh, we introduced vectors, and we said that those could happen in three uh, different directions. There could be components, x, y, and z, for a velocity, for a displacement, for an acceleration. How does that apply to rotational motion? Now, this is a little weird, but uh, what we do for a rot rotating object, so here's an object that's rotating, what we do is we take the axis of rotation, so we have an axis right here of rotation for that object, so there's the axis, and uh, we define the vector to be along the axis. Now you might think, well, that's a little, a little funny that we would define the vector direction to be along the axis, uh, and the reason why is that uniquely determines um, what orientation the rotating object has. So if, if omega is in this direction, then that indicates that rotations are, are in, a, in a plane uh, perpendicular to that axis. So the object that's rotating is, um, if we draw a circular path for that rotation, the plane that contains that path is perpendicular. Now, uh, there, there's no other direction that would orient the, um, that circular motion.
And then you, you, know, you say, well, what about mathematically? If we define vectors this way, are they going to have the same properties that the other vectors have? And it, it turns out they do, for the most part. Uh, there's, there's, um, they actually get um, referred to as a, a pseudo-vector or an axial vector. So rotational quantities, uh, the vector, we can, we can take dot products, we can take cross products, all of the uh, operations that we've done with, um, with vectors, uh, you can... Um, the, these, uh, these rotational vectors will work. Um, so, rotational displacements uh, are measured uh, along the axis. Omega is measured along the axis. And uh, rotational accelerations are measured uh, along that axis. Well, we'll have to go back and look at... at um, if the axis, if something is speeding up and slowing down around an axis, then the uh, angular acceleration also will be along that axis. But it doesn't have to be. It's kind of like uh, linear accelerations and accelerations. Linear uh, velocities and accelerations uh, don't have to be in the same direction. So here we go. Uh, we're going to come back and look at some vector stuff later. Let's get um, a set of formulas set out for us. Now, when we did kinematics before, in the linear examples, uh, what we were able to do is go through and derive three. Actually, the book uses a fourth formula. I, I think we tended to use the top three, or at least I did. Um, and uh, what we can do then is we can take all of those formulas, and I hope you look at them and go, yeah, those are familiar. I remember all of kinematics. Kinematics was uh, the most uh, clear portion of the course. That was the easiest part of the course, maybe. Uh, but what we can do is we can take out all of the X's, the V's, and the A's, and replace them with theta, omega, and alpha. And it works. So these are defined for just one dimension. Uh, one dimension here means that I'm looking at an object where the axis of rotation remains pointing in the same direction. If the axis of rotation tips, if something's rotating here, but then it begins to tip, uh, then we have to start looking at different components. So that does make things more complicated. For now, we're just going to stick with these one-dimensional rotations. And by one dimension, we mean that the axis is as long just one uh, one direction and the axis of rotation isn't changing. So um, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say if I look at those formulas on the right and go, yeah, those look familiar. I'm so used to that. We did so many examples with that. I've really got those down. And then I look at the ones on the left and I go, I have no idea what those formulas are. They just look, well, they're all in Greek, right? So it's a bunch of Greek letters. Uh, so the, the goal here is to make those as familiar as the ones on the right. Uh, and, you know, that comes from working through a lot of examples. And, uh, again, it's not just doing the examples, but it's stopping and thinking about what that represents. You know, if you have an object that's rotating, uh, its omega is telling you what speed it's rotating at. Uh, the acceleration is telling you if it's picking up speed or slowing down. Those sorts of things uh, you want to stop and think about. As, um, as you're going through. Oh, look, it's the horse and the lion again. So uh, they're talking about angular and linear velocities and accelerations, and uh, we've, we've looked at a lot of kinematics now, and so we're ready to answer, I hope, any sort of question at all. So what it says is the carousel initially is at rest. You know, everybody climbs on. At t equals zero, it begins an, a constant angular acceleration alpha 0 0.06 radians per second per second. Uh, that increases the angular velocity for a time of 8 seconds. So for 8 seconds this thing is it's picking up speed, right? It's spinning a little faster, a little faster, a little faster. That goes on for 8 seconds and the rate at which it's picking up speed is 0 0.060 radians per second squared. 
Now, I hope at least the radians per second squared, you have an idea of what that means. I know it's hard to estimate what that might feel like. But um, let's see what they want us to calculate. Um, after eight seconds has taken place, they want to know what's going to be the angular velocity of the carousel. What is the linear velocity of a child located 2.5 meters from the center? The, what is the tangential acceleration? What's the centripetal acceleration? What's the total linear acceleration of the child? So it's kind of everything, right? All the kinematics is there. This is a good example. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that you want to, you know, look at the homework problems, look at these problems from lecture. So angular and linear kinematics. And uh, here we go. We've got a couple different paths mapped out here. The horse and the lion, I guess. So we're just going to pick one of those. So let's say that there is an object, I guess it's the child, uh, at a certain um, distance from the center. What, they, what they've told us is that uh, initially it's at rest. So I'll put in zero radians per second for omega naught. Uh, for theta naught, I'm going to put in zero for theta naught too, right? Let's, let's see those formulas again. So if you go back and look at the formulas, there they are. Uh, if this thing is starting from rest, I don't see any reason why we can't say uh, theta... Oh, they didn't do the... Theta. Where are the theta naughts? Oh, they really did leave those out, didn't they? Well, good. So the theta naughts, they just left those out. And they left out the x naughts on the other side. So uh, theta naught is zero, uh, according to these formulas. Uh, and then the omega naughts can also be zero, so all of those terms are going to drop out. And then we can leave what's, uh, we can use uh, whatever's left in those formulas. So here we go. Uh, the first thing they said is calculate what the angular velocity is uh, after eight seconds. So we can take alpha times t, uh, 0 0.060 radians per second squared times eight seconds. It says that after eight seconds, it's going that fast. That is the rotational or angular velocity after eight seconds. And then, moving on to part B, part B says, well, if I'm located, I guess this was the child was 2.5 meters from the axis of rotation, and see, axis is labeled here too, or it should be, it should have something saying axis. Uh, then we can take r times omega, and that will give us a linear velocity. Now remember, the radians are unitless, so when we're paying attention to radi uh, the units here, uh, the radians will drop out. We'll just be left with meters per second. And so it looks like uh, that location at 2.5 meters away from the axis is moving at 1.20 meters per second. Uh, part C is saying, what is the tangential acceleration? Now, I'm, I'm not clear on that because did it continue to accelerate? It says that it accelerates for eight seconds, and then right at eight seconds, it makes it sound like the acceleration stopped. So I guess what we want to do is say, during the time between zero seconds and the eight second mark, the angular acceleration was uh, 0 0.060 radians per second squared. There's a squared right there. Uh, Mm, it should be there, I don't, I don't see it, uh, but there should be a squared here. Uh, 0 0.060 radians per second squared times the 2.5, that's going to give us the tangential acceleration. And that tangential acceleration is going to come out in meters per second squared. There it is. Um, and that's it. The radians went away. Remember, the radians are unitless. Those will cancel out. Now, we also want to find out, uh, you know, this point where the child is located, is under, and the child is undergoing radial acceleration and tangential acceleration. Uh, now, to find out what the radial acceleration is, we have to use r times omega squared, or we can. Now, that's varying. So notice that the tangential, tangential acceleration was fixed during that eight-second interval. The tangential acceleration stayed right at 0 0.150 meters per second per second. But the radial acceleration steadily increased 
because omega was increasing. And that makes sense, right? If you're spinning faster, uh, the uh, omega is increasing, then the radial acceleration is going up. So putting all the numbers into that, uh, I put in the omega, squared it, that's going to give us radian squared. Well, radian squared goes away too. This is second squared meters. Yeah, the units check out. So uh, the radial component of the acceleration, 0.576 meters per second squared. Now in part E, what they said was this. Uh, there was a tangential acceleration and there was a radial acceleration. What's the total acceleration? Now, in most cases, we want to think of the tangential and radial acceleration kind of independent. They're, they're due to different effects, right? Uh, the tangential is due to an actual rotational acceleration taking place. But the radial component just depends on omega. It doesn't depend on alpha. And so uh, there's really kind of, kind of different sources here. Uh, they're both instantaneous equations, meaning that um, whatever the value of alpha is at a given instant, r times alpha will tell us what the tangential acceleration is at that instant. Whatever omega is at a particular instant, r omega squared will tell us what the radial acceleration is at that instant. So uh, we can do these uh, instant by instant diagrams. Now they wanted us to add these two acceleration components together. Uh, if you look at the diagrams, you realize pretty quickly the tangential component and the radial component, they're perpendicular to each other. They're always going to be perpendicular to each other. And that means that we can add them using Pythagorean's theorem. So again, that's another handy property uh, about the tangential and radial accelerations, they're going to be perpendicular to each other, and uh, we can add them using Pythagorean's theorem. When I did that, I got 0.595 meters per second squared. And then I can figure out an angle. So uh, we might ask this, uh, at what angle is the net acceleration tipped compared with the radial acceleration? That's the reference I went with. And so I used a tangent, and uh, I hope I got that right. I think I did. And it worked out to be 14.6 degrees. So if we go back and look at the individual components, uh, who, was, who was bigger? And it turned out that the radial acceleration was quite a bit bigger than the tangential acceleration. Now, that wasn't during the entire eight seconds. Uh, remember, this had the same value between zero and eight seconds, whereas the radial acceleration kept increasing as omega went up. But uh, after the eight seconds of acceleration has taken place, the radial component is quite a bit larger. And um, so we're hitting that 14.6 degrees. Now we can think of uh, forces uh, for this object also. So here's this kid. And, uh, you know, she's sitting on this merry-go-round. And she has some mass. And there are accelerations taking place, which tells us this. If, if the child is actually staying on the merry-go-round, they're not being flung off the merry-go-round, uh, the tendency for the child would be to go in a straight line, right, uh, at, at a constant speed. Now, in order to keep the child going in circular motion, we need a radial force. And so, uh, did I make that up with the 25 kilograms? They said it, didn't they? I made it up. Okay, I, I made it up. And so uh, I did want to emphasize this fact. So uh, let's say that we have a child with 25 kilograms. I'm going to need this much radial force. Uh, I'm going to need 14.4 uh, newtons uh, to hold the child in place. That's, you know, that's like three pounds of force. It's not an enormous force. But if that force is not there, the child will go in a straight line. Now that force can easily come from the friction of the seat that she's sitting on. So there needs to be maybe a frictional force. If there's not enough friction, then there's an armrest uh, that the child can hold on to.
and the side of that C is going to provide that 14.4 newtons. Now, uh, if there are no forces, then there are not going to be any of these accelerations. If there's no force in this direction, then the child's not going to be picking up speed. So the tangential component of the force is going to provide an acceleration that makes um, the linear velocity go up. And calculating for that, it's 3.75 newtons. So those are the forces that have to be there. If, uh, you know, if this platform, if this merry-go-round is a frictionless platform, nobody can hold on. Uh, they're just going to slide off the merry-go-round, right? They'll go in a straight line, the merry-go-round will um, continue rotating, and uh, they'll be off the merry So that would be a really cool amusement park ride. You could have people get on, and then you could have a switch where you turn off all the friction, right? Or you turn off all of the forces that are allowing them to continue in this motion, and, and then they just slide off. I mean, you have some cushions and stuff. It, would, it might be fun, you know, the frictionless ride. Um, all right, so those are the forces that would be required. Uh, anywhere there's an acceleration, there's got to be a force, and that force has to be uh, as large, or it's going to be equal to m times whatever that acceleration is. We can determine how much force is at work whenever an acceleration shows up. All right, uh, here's a couple more quantities we could talk about. Uh, rotations per second. If you haven't noticed it until now, I really do like this idea of rotations. Revolution is the word we use. We talk about, you know, 100 revolutions per minute, something like that. Uh, I, I like just calling them rotations. Um, anyway, uh, there is a frequency of rotation that we can define, and that's equal to the uh, angular velocity divided by 2 pi. Now, the 2 pi here is simply a conversion factor. Uh, that 2 pi uh, what we could write into that is radians per cycle. So go ahead and do that. I should have written that in. So this is like, uh, this is in radians per second. This is in radians per cycle. The radians cancel. And what we're left with is cycles per second. And those are referred to as hertz. So if we're looking at how many rotations per second does something undergo, we could report that in hertz. Uh, the period of rotation is 1 over the frequency. So if they're asking about what's the period of rotation, uh, what is the frequency of rotation, what is the angular frequency, there's an easy way to con uh, convert back and forth between all of those. But uh, good thing to know. So understand how the omegas, the f's, and the big t's are all related and what units uh, they're going to be in. All right, here's another example. Let's see if we've got our kinematics figured out here. Uh, it says we have a hard, a hard drive. Uh, the platter of a hard drive on a computer rotates. Hmm, it's not flash memory. It's, it's actual moving memory. It's a platter that's moving in a hard drive. Uh, rotates at 7,200 RPM. Now, RPM stands for revolutions per minute. Also, I mean, that's how many rotations. A revolution is the same as a rotation. Uh, what's the angular velocity in radians per second uh, if the reading head of the drive, so you've got this memory, uh, and you've got a bunch of uh, magnetized regions mapped out onto this uh, rotating disk, and then there is a, a head that is able to measure the magnetic uh, field at different locations on that rotating disk, and it can sample that magnetic field very rapidly uh, in order to read the memory for that, um, for that hard drive. Um, so we want to come up with a linear speed uh, at, at a certain location, three centimeters from the rotation axis. Uh, it says that a, if a bit of information, a zero or a one, requires a half micron of length along the direction of motion, how many bits um, can the head, uh, the writing head, write when it's three centimeters from the axis. So the idea is, uh, the idea here is, is it's rotating at a certain speed. So we've got this memory disk, and it's rotating uh, 7,200 revolutions per minute. This is pretty fast. Uh, 
So let's do some units conversions on that. We looked at an example earlier. Uh, this is in revolutions per minute. Uh, I can replace the revolutions with 2 pi radians, and I can replace the minute with 60 seconds, and that works out to be 754 radians per second. So however you, you know, however you calculate this, it's like 120 times a second, right? It's doing 100 revolu 120 revolutions, if, I, if I'm ca calculating this right, 120 revolutions per second. Okay, so it's spinning at a pretty good speed. Now, we're specifically looking at this point, point A, and it's three centimeters from the, the central axis. So uh, this also should say axis on that point right there. So three centimeters, 0 0.030 meters. And so the speed, the linear speed, we can get is, is R times omega. So uh, that was one of those uh, formulas in that table uh, that we're learning and, and getting more familiar with. So the R value here is 0 0.03 meters uh, times the 754 radians per second. That worked out to be uh, 22.6 meters per second. Now that would be what? That's going to be 50 miles an hour, something like that. So um, the disk, locations on the disk, are moving past uh, the head that's, that's trying to read all of the data, and it's going by at 50 miles an hour. And there are all of these little half micron uh, bits of information. So let's see, um, well, let's take a look and see how many uh, bits of information we could read in a second. So this is moving at 22.6 meters per second, and there's one bit for every 5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. That's how much length one of the bits has. And that says that per second, we're getting 45,200,000 bits being read. Uh, assuming that when it's spinning at this speed, it can, it can measure every bit along that path. So that would give us you know, 45 megabits uh, per second that it's able to read. Now, uh, the circumference, I guess they asked this, uh, the circumference at the three, maybe I added this on, the circumference at the three centimeter mark is given by, I plugged that value in, uh, 0.188 meters. So the circumference at that point is 18.8 centimeters. Uh, if we take that circumference and divide through by the length per bit, it says that there are only 376,000 bits along that circular path. So if it's going to be able to read 45 million bits every second, it's going to have to be spiraling. It's going to have to, uh, you know, it reads around one path and it, the head shifts a little bit, so it, it slowly spirals out or slowly spirals in in order to uh, pick up the different regions where the bits are being stored. Okay. But, but it's good rotational, um, a good problem, a good example, uh, looking at comparisons between uh, rotational and um, linear quantities. All right, let's see. Um, so here's a disk, uh, and it's talking about omega varying as a function of time. So uh, that sounds like an acceleration to me, right? If the omega is constant, then the thing just keeps spinning at the same rate. But if omega is varying, then it's picking up speed. Now the formula they gave us here, this is a linear formula. It says that omega is equal to a, a constant value plus 1.2 times t. So uh, what do you think those numbers are? And I think the 1.6 is omega naught. Because when t is equal to 0, omega equals 1.6. So 1.6 radians per second is omega naught. And then the 1.2, what would the 1.2 number be in this formula? And that would be the angular acceleration. So uh, uh, it, if we go back and look at the formulas that they showed us earlier. So they showed us this table. Right? Ooh, it was a ways back. Uh, 
Uh, but what we're looking at now is this formula, and they've given us a value for omega naught, and they've given us a value for the rotational acceleration. All right, so they want us to figure out what's the acceleration, and they want us to figure out what uh, the speed uh, is and what the components of acceleration is at a point on the edge of the disk, and they want us to do that at a time of t equals two seconds. Okay, so this is what the diagrams are looking like, right? So we, we're, we're starting to get a, a feel for how this works. So here's a disk. Here's an axis of rotation, and it, it clearly states axis right here. That's my axis. It's a point on the edge they want us to look at. And so we're going to be following a circular path, which is kind of following the circumference of this uh, round disk. Now, the R value they gave us this time uh, is 3 meters. So just verifying, my, yeah, it's a disk of 3 meters. So the diameter here is 6 meters. It's a pretty big disk. It's kind of a rotating platform here. And uh, they've given us omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t, where initially we're spinning at this speed, and then we start picking up speed. So at t equals zero, we begin to increase, and it's a constant rotational acceleration. And the value is 1.20 radians per second squared. So that's all kind of information here. Now, at, at two seconds, they want us to calculate what the acceleration is, and um, it's constant. So that's not changing. It's the same value at, uh, at all times. Uh, the acceleration has that uh, constant value. And then in part B, uh, we've got uh, a velocity that's equal to r times omega. Plugging into this formula, we find that the omega at 2 seconds is 1.60 plus whatever the acceleration is times 2 seconds. So it says after 2 seconds, we're going faster. We're now spinning at 4.00 uh, radians per second, and then uh, what would the V value be? So V is equal to R times omega, and uh, what we can do is the omega value, um, it's 3 meters, okay, the R value, so the R value is 3 meters, there it is, and so I'm going to put in my 3 meters, and we determine that the rotational velocity at that point is 4 radians per second. That gives us a speed, a linear speed, of 12 meters per second. That's how fast point A is moving along that circular path. And then it looks like part C is over here. So what about the tangential acceleration? Well, the tangential acceleration is given by, given by R times alpha. And the R, again, is 3 meters. It's a big platform. Uh, that 12 meters per second, that's pretty fast. That's 20, you know, 25, 30 miles an hour that it's moving. Uh, the acceleration here is going to be 3.6 uh, meters per second squared. So uh, we're getting up to some pretty good size accelerations. And then the radial acceleration, r omega squared, that's going to be 48 meters per second squared. So uh, it's going to be hard to hold on to this rotating platform. Uh, 48 meters per second squared. That's like 5 Gs, right, of acceleration. So uh, hold on, okay? You're going to have to have something to hold on to. Uh, if this were an amusement park ride, nah, they couldn't operate it, not at 5 Gs. Uh, they, they're not going to have something like that. So uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of an extreme acceleration. Um, you're going to start having people pass out. If... That's what this is. I, you know, everything circular here, it, I, I just think it's an amusement park ride. You go, oh, what if this was an amusement park ride? So, um, constant angular acceleration. Here's another example looking at uh, a centrifuge. And uh, let me, ooh, let me check the time right here. Uh, this might be a good time to wrap up for the day. Let me take a look and see. Uh, let's take a look at this last example. Uh, that's going to get us through all of the kinematics. So this is kind of our last kinematics example. Um, it's a centrifuge. Let's go back. Uh, 
actually it's fairly involved. So let's do this. Let's stop here for the day. And, uh, and then we'll pick up, we'll do a, a quick review of some of the kinematic stuff that we've done. And then we'll move on to torque. Something to, to look forward to. Uh, come back and figure out what torque is. Um, okay. So maybe we will... Ooh, we'll end with that uh, picture right there. If you guys have questions, stop by. So the rotational stuff, it's a little tricky. So uh, make sure that you're stopping by with questions that you've got.